Well, thank you very, very much. Um, five years is not a very long time in computing terms, but in publishing terms, particularly journals, it's a lifetime. So um, I just want to say thank you very much and happy birthday to the Internet Policy Review. Well done. Um, and it's a privilege and an honour uh, and a pleasure to be able to give the first few words today. So um, having ended your your um, introduction, um, Frederick, with uh, honouring uh, important Turkish activists, I think that resonates, I hope, with some of the things I want to say today. Human rights, issues around human rights, what they are, what they're not, that's what keeps me busy. But I'm not going to talk so much specifically about those many, many issues. They kind of frame what I want to say. I'm going to riff off the interview that Frederick and I did, which is in your little um, old media book it. I also use old media. I use ink on dead paper, uh, dead wood. So, um, but I'm also using the silicon to silicon touch today. So I'm going to refer to. I'm going to talk about the structure agency tension that we're all working in as researchers, also as activists, if we wish to call ourselves that, or as advocates, as technical experts, as designers, as teachers, as students. And there's always this tension with the structure, the structural facets of what we're working with, and the idea of what is agency today. How does one really make a difference? Assuming one wants to. Okay, so um, three big statements, just to sort of make three big statements and get them out of the way. Number one, I, I work with the assumption that policy is political by definition and certainly by preference. So policy making processes and outcomes are inherently about finding out or being engaged in exercising, if not resisting, or repurposing incumbent and emerging powers. And in this case, of course, the internet, however defined, is our focus. But of course, in case of what I used to, I tend to use internet now as, a, just as an adjective rather than a proper noun. So internet, media, communications, computer networks, digital processes, life, air, love, call it what you like. Um, what if we want to think about policy and as power is now located at what I like to call, and others as well, the online offline nexus of internet design, internet terms of access and use, and content, what we now call it data. But content still does matter. And I think those are ways to actually try and uh, keep some sort of, um, sort of structure, good structure to what we're trying to do. Now, actors uh, include, of course, us, and they include institutions, all these power brokers that we like to define and isolate and talk about. But also, I think, as we know more and more, non-human actors. Uh, Bruno Latour uses the word actors. Um, and non-human actors are now including uh, artificial intelligences, bots, you know, infrastructures themselves are arguably non-human actors, Internet of Things. Uh, the, the transmission highways and byways themselves, they affect how we live, what we find out, who we work with, how we get to what we want to know. And everything is now becoming automated. Automated. So let me just try and operate this. Right, I'm going to use a bit of artwork here. Um, this is an educational gathering. So this is a um, um, fair use situation. And I'm going to acknowledge all artists as I can by name. A very exciting artist going on using these technologies in extraordinary ways things of beauty. Remember that some of these technologies also create things of beauty. Okay? This is a wonderful artist called Lee Nam. I could talk for 20 minutes just about this piece, but this is a still from one of his uh, exhibits called Reborn the Light, Reborn the TV. So, so what I'm trying to say is within my three big statements, however you might define power, whichever discipline you belong to and how you prefer to talk about it, we're also talking about ideas and psycho-emotional dimensions to everyday life that are now mediate by, mediated by and structured through these internet-dependent forms of media and communications. And I'm going to quote really now about this piece, which actually moves in and out. The dove moves, I will tell you. The <laughs> It's an old television with the projection of a dove that is lowered in and out of this uh, huge, huge um, container of water, slowly and surely, and then as it, as it comes up, the water pours out the bottom. It's quite an extraordinary piece because of, of course, the effect of the light and concrete material objects. And then he says TVs, I'm going to say like computers, and humans are similar in their structure. Humans are made up of body and spirit, as is TV and computers of body, frame, and light, digital content. 
In other words, the artist says, if a human body is a vessel for holding spirit, then a TV computer is a vessel for holding light, spirit, and mind. So this is my way of getting us a little bit out of our kind of possible techno-determinist frameworks. Possible. I'm not going to accuse you of all being techno-determinist. I know some of you all too well. <laughs> okay. So, I'll just let you take that in for a minute. If you want to think about who these actors or agents or actants are, some people like to call them stakeholders. Some of us are forced to use the word stakeholders. Um, whatever. Uh, we could argue, and most people would, that corporations, private actors have been extraordinarily important and they are still extremely dominant form of actors in the internet political world. Um, they also work with, but also, as we know, against, in spite of how state actors, governments, wish to uh, set the rule books themselves. But this is hardly a new thing to say. I do think that this generation of what we call tech giants has reached a scale and a level of depth not unlike our artist's work. A scale, a depthness and a scale are that we have yet to actually to really understand and we're trying to. If, if Facebook can boast that two out of seven people are on the planet, on the planet, two out of seven people on this planet uh, subscribe to Facebook apps and platforms, that's a hell of a lot of people. Okay, that's bigger than any nation state. And I think one needs to take notice of that. Even if some of those accounts are dormant, even if some of those accounts are fake news, Still two out of seven. So, just going to move way up a level of analysis now, right up to the globe. Um, when we talk about internet technologies, we often assume that they just began yesterday. No, they are actually dependent on very old infrastructures, telecommunications, telephone and telegraph. And this may sound old and dusty, but it's extremely powerful when you think about the history of the age of empire. You think about how the British Empire, the Dutch Empire, the French Empire, how they maintained the imperial rule is through communications. So governments, states have always had a vested interest in being in charge in some way or other of these transmission pathways. And it's an engineer who told me, I did work in an engineering school for quite a few years, he said to me, it's all about transmission. And you think about it, if you can control access to the transmission infrastructure, there's your revolution. And where did most revolutionaries go? The TV, the radio, <laughs> not internet connections. Here's the next one. Oh, this one's back in 99. Telegeography just does great stuff, highly recommended. Selçuk, who's the late Turkish cartoonist, it was a joke back then, in the early noughties, but I'm um, mm, too true now, perhaps. And this is from 2011. Facebook, writing up the world to civilise. Um, that has changed a little bit, become more dense perhaps, but nonetheless I think it's a very, very powerful uh, representation of what has come before. Except, who owns and controls this uh, particular map? Okay, so I have no idea how long I've been talking, Frederick. Well, oh, eight, okay. Um, all right, so you think you're up to date? You're not. We're not even now up to date. This is the tricky part about the area all of us are working in, is the fact it's a fast-moving target. We read about this all the time. But as um, uh, computer hacker Barbie reminds us, things are out of date very, very quickly. Highly recommended computer hacker Barbie. Fantastic girl. Really, you should follow her. But, I mean, lots of inside jokes there, but... You could actually update this for like this week and have us be the butt of the joke. So as I said in the interview, the thing is that <laughs> complexity is the thing and the, and the system and the, the context in which we need to begin with our work. And we all know when you do internet research or internet governance research, it's, it's extremely complex. There are many, many topics vying for attention. It's very hard sometimes to talk about uh, to not try and talk about everything all the time. Uh, we have these conversations in the GigaNet uh, committee meetings and we know at conferences uh, you can get very, very specific or you can get very, very general. I think the challenge is to keep the two together, to be focused on whatever issue or technology or application or practice or platform, you call it what you like, but also to remember the historical context and the cultural context in which you're working. Because without context, what you do is meaningless. 
because context is everything. Now, when I started way back um, in the early 90s, there weren't these kinds of aggregated statistics available. I think the ITU had a few kind of sort of tired looking statistics about something called the internet. Um, it was all about telecom. Uh, but now you can actually go online to things like the World Internet Statistics and get a pretty good picture of how things are shifting. Uh, it's from there that you need to extrapolate your narrative and figure out what's really going on and get underneath the numbers. But that's just a sort of an indicator of where we can now go to find quite straightforward facts and figures, which not so long ago were very difficult to get a hold of in this particular um, ag um, aggregation. At least what I'm concerned, it's always concerned with who's in charge or what is in charge. Um, this is uh, from Chapat, who's a Swiss cartoonist. He's done a lot of work on this. I think it's a very, very clever and astute understanding of how things are actually um, heading extraterrestrial. That isn't just about um, the, under, the underground and the undersea cables. There's also a connection. There's a th three-dimensional thing going on. We've got the surface of the planet, we've got beyond the planet, we've got in the middle of the planet, we've got under the sea. It's quite extraordinary physical infrastructure that we're all connected into, and some of us are all incredibly dependent on. And this is where the tensions are between structure and agency. The same kinds of satellite connections can help a Coast Guard, the Italian Coast Guard, or Frontex, locate, track, and follow boats of desperate people on the Mediterranean locate, track, and follow boatloads of desperate people on the Mediterranean. Locate, track, and follow, and watch as desperate boats of people on the Mediterranean die. Whatever your politics might be about refugees and migration, the same technologies that help Coast Guards locate, track, follow, and watch people die can also be used to, to divert and to get around the gatekeeping powers of these same forces in order to survive these extraordinary journeys. So I'm referring here to other work I do. I'm very much confronted with the liberating possibilities, but also the oppressive and um, murderous possibilities of the same, the same networks, in fact. Back to Earth. The Internet Governance Forum. Oh, we love to hate the Internet's Governance Forum. <laughs> What a useless, what a useless pace. What a useless meeting. Nothing ever happens. We just talk. No decisions are made. So where are the decisions made? Well, they're not made in internet governance forum because everyone's probably looking at their Facebook page. Okay? But that's not the point. If you're interested in the research and trying to figure out processes and trying to understand dynamics, because if policy is politics, then the outcome of the policy is not where the politics lie. The outcome of the policy is the end of a long, long process. So as a researcher, you might want to think about, well, which end of the process am I trying to get a, a, a grip on? And how much can I extrapolate from the final product? Who knows what he's up to? This is actually in Baku. And anyone who's there, it's when the, the human rights agenda started to take shape. And there was a lot of um, activity going on around the conference. Uh, we all discovered if we used the word human rights, we were suddenly offline. So, who knows what he was up to? And this is a real key thing for at least the work I do. Uh, for the structures, the infrastructures, the applications, the tools, the fascinating technologies that I know are, are a really important object of research and interest for the, for the review and of course a lot of us in our research. Uh, it's not actually the internet governance domain, however, that might be defined or how it might be currently being redefined, where social resistance is actually discussed enough. We don't theorise agency enough. I think we should try and think about that a little bit more. Because if those actors and those agents are non human, then we've got some very interesting conceptual arguments to be made. And we've got some very interesting philosophers and historians of technology to perhaps think about, such as Andrew Finberg. Back to Assange. We can't not talk about Assange. And I just love this kind of multi-level kind of approach. I actually got that photo. Um, and he was speaking here in um, Istanbul in 2014. But of course, we've moved from Assange to fake news. Or is he fake news? 
or, I mean, where do you even start? Somehow, we seem to have come full circle to the 90s where everyone was concerned, particularly governments, about content, about filtering content filters, making sure our children didn't see terrible things, making sure that online uh, pornography was regulated, or created enough tax revenue, or was stopped being on your belief systems, um, or worrying about whether the truth was out there or not. Um, so if people like Assange keep reminding us just how fragile our understanding of truth and messages and journalism and any kind of story, and what academic work is a story, how actual, um, actually fragile it is, and how much his story is also perhaps the story of changing attitudes and changing spin and changing narratives. So it's just a sort of throw it in there. Okay. After all, Keeping down to civil society, see I'm doing my three stakeholder groups, sort of ish. Um, you know, revolutions can be good for business. And every revolution has been good for one particular kind of technology, and this is the ones that we now think about from the 2011 uprisings. Um, and I think this is both a reflection of the spirit at the time, but also perhaps a, a critical moment we need to think about. Uh, Revolutions are not caused. Revolution will not be digitized, will not be digitized, will not be digitized. Mainly because, as Bill Scott Heron told us, any revolution you see on TV is the result of what has already happened, is not the beginning. So, Another indication of how physical these networks are, access can be simply cut. And of course, we need to own the governments. We're now in a situation where the very um, extrajudicial forms of online surveillance that Edward Snowden uh, called the world's attention to, that put human rights on the agenda in a way no one expected it to be, have now become legitimated and made into law. And I certainly find this a very disturbing development historically. And I think the historical record will show just um, how problematic that has been. To make legal the very... The, okay, there are some checks and balances. We can discuss that later. But on the, in principle, making these forms of online surveillance the norm and not the exception. Okay, so back to Fienberg, because he, of course, is a theorist of agency in the light of technology. But of course, again, this is not new. Okay, so to argue that online or surveillance on the sort of techno level is new is to forget your history, as we know um, from this, this lovely film, so to speak. Um, and uh, people who watch people do fall in love with the objects of surveillance. And this is why I find this particular film disabled and very, very moving, because he falls in love with the thing he's watching. And we mustn't fall in love too much with the thing we're studying. Okay, because actually you have zero privacy. So cynical, but so true. And the late Casper Bowden would agree, however, for different very different political reasons. Okay. Is code now the only law? No, because code is as much an idea, and law is more than the letter of the law. And the rule of the law, rule of law is not always good law. So when I hear people say rule of law, rule of law, I also get nervous. Because some law is absolute rubbish. Um, and then we get these institutions, you know, IGF, UN, rubbish, we don't care, we don't need the UN. Okay, let's move to these other governance institutions like ICANN, IETF, uh, um, or you name them. They were up here, one big happy family. We all get on terribly well. We all agree on the same thing. We're going to roll the internet out to the next billion. I think that whole thing needs to be problematized far more acutely, even from a very technical point of view. It doesn't have to be a philosophical point. You can look at it technically, and some of you already are. And the review has been covering some of these topics. This is a very good descriptive model of how this stuff works, but it has no power analysis in it at all. And I'm always interested in analysis and definitions and redefinitions of power as they shift. Speaking of which, back to content, back to censorship, back to the power of silence according to Pope Francis himself. Um, I just got this today. Even he's been on the internet. Okay, nearly there, nearly there. Uh, so, okay, what to do? 
not everybody as a researcher is engaged in, in changing policy agendas. Not everybody as an internet governance researcher needs to be. Uh, academics and scholars can do their work without having to be uh, sat in Baku and Azerbaijan and listen to internet governance forums uh, um, panels. But some of us, and many of us, many of us in this room, are actually engaged as policy activists and advocates. We have to balance that kind of scholarly Academic, academic standards that we need with our desire to make changes. And of course, we don't all agree on what the changes should be. But I do think it is possible to critically engage with internet policy politics as a researcher and to be, do political internet policy as an activist. It's not easy, and you can't do it for everything. So I kind of stick to my little corner, more by accident than design, so to speak. It does matter. It does matter what knowledge we are producing. It does matter how we take that knowledge as scholars to even the UN, even I can, even with a German, Dutch, French parliament. It does matter. Not just our CV. Because we are actually, as branch organizers, and doing branching, we're not civil society, we're moving from the state or the corporate sectors. We are all deeply engaged with each other. We are deeply entangled. So it's not so much civil society versus the state versus corporates. It's more like state society complex, to use branching right too, or even the corporate society complex. It's a completely disingenuous to argue that these three categories are completely separate. They're just a convenient form of access, where you actually give yourself a correct sort of access to certain sorts of places. And when you see the um, excitement, a simple booklet, that's why I loved your book, Frederick. <laughs> a simple booklet articulating our uh, human rights and principles for the internet. That's what it was about, just articulating and make it relevant for the internet to a bunch of young people up in Jean Passo in Brazil. It's just the joy in their face to see A in their own language and B saying something about the things that they're concerned about. Um, and they're just reminding me actually it's kind of worth it to sit through those boring meetings. But obviously there's a whole object of research engaged in here, these sorts of um, initiatives themselves. Even if they stay quite high, they're not actually technically that detailed. For some legal experts, they're not legally enough detailed. For some historians, they're already out of date. To me, that's not the point. The point is that finally the narrative is starting to get connected. And the internet itself is a narrative, and human rights is also a narrative. The history of human rights is one of the world's biggest narratives, and it's not an unproblematic one. And that's why activism sticks into place, I think, now as an academic, particularly from Goldsmith, oh, human rights, bourgeois institution, you know, the human rights, so yesterday. As an activist, oh, you know, it's not just in Turkey that um, things are being censored. Up in the Kinnitz this week, Dresden, we've got local dignitaries trying to actually suppress basic news articles about their associations with far-right groups. So, censorship is happening everywhere. Pressure is happening everywhere. I don't know where this one came from, but it's not an argument that the internet should be available to all. And this goes right back to the old telephone argument that telephones should be available to all. But who pays? So I kind of mix it up with my classic Walter Benjamin quote, because I can never leave home without him. And, um, and this is as well, again, about the history. Uh, if the internet and these screens and these spirits and these concrete boxes are framing how you see and feel about the world, and those who design them have such power to actually structure those experiences in very specific ways, with a very specific expertise that not everybody has, then um, they are actually part of the historical circumstances that are changing the sense perception of our world. That's not technological determinism, that's agency. And I think well, actually, there yeah, I don't want to blah blah blah. So that'll do. I think that's my final word. But <laughs> I, I do have something to show you. Um, it is the Ian Arm piece, and I'm um, Q and A. I hope you have something to say. But we're going to just switch to the video and just let it run.